morning, we're going to talk about loving God in Babylon. Okay, what does it mean to love God in Babylon? So loving God well is actually the end goal of our life on earth, uh, restoring our relationship back to our Creator, knowing what it means to love our Heavenly Father. But actually, it's increasingly difficult to love God. You know why? Because we are living in a secular, secular world that is increasingly anti-religious. That's why it's harder in these last days to, to love God. And with post-COVID, right, it's even harder. Why? Because people are choosing convenience over commitment. Much harder. Uh, and uh, the Bible really tells us that in the last days, there will be an increase in immorality, there will be an increase in evilness. Okay, so... Um, just state some examples of why it is harder uh, in, in this day and age to love God. There are many influences that are bombarding us. For example, today, uh, if you watch any show on Netflix, most of the time, they will have a gay scene. Correct or not? It, they, will, they will just slot one in. Uh. And then now, uh, it's gone even to children's show, you know. It's quite crazy, uh, I mean... If you ask me, it's quite crazy. So the latest Pixar show, like, like year, there was a gay scene. And the CEO wanted to take out, but people, people make a lot of noise, so they put back in this gay scene, all right? Uh, and because of the gay scene, right, it's banned in 14 countries, and Singapore is NC-16. Okay? They're losing a lot of money, box office, but they're willing to do it. It's crazy because... Uh, there is a normalization of gay agenda. If you're not aware, it's happening everywhere. All right? So is it difficult? Of course it's difficult. Is your children exposed? Of course they're exposed. So in, in time to come, we will address some of this issue because we need to talk about it. If you don't talk about it, they'll learn it from uh, the media itself. Uh, so it's affecting uh, everyone. And this normalization is a process. And uh, if you think about it, Actually, only 1% of the population is gay. International stats, huh? 1%, but they are normalizing it such that in today's context, if you do a survey internationally, 4% of Gen Z will say they are gay. 2% of millennial generation will say they are gay. And 1% of the other general adult population will say they are gay. Why is that so? If gay is born and not made, you will ask, how come the stats so skewed towards the young? Well, you, you may want to consider, could it be normalization? Could it be experimentation that's causing this upward trend in the young generation? So there, there is a, a worrying, worrying situation. Uh, and uh, there is pushback. All right, so uh, in general, even if you hold to a stand, in today's context, there will be, a, there will be pushback. If you go to social media, if you say something that you are uh, uh, your own beliefs in LGBT, you will be cancelled. Okay, you will be slaughtered. So there's pushback. In fact, the majority of Singaporeans, six out of ten, okay, uh, doesn't like religious leaders to speak up on LGBT issues. So there is a there is a trend, uh, anti-religious movement. Okay, and but for the church, we are not against gay. We want to love the sinner. Okay, we want to love everybody. Uh, but hate the sin. So we want to reach out to them. Okay? We want to be known uh, to be people that embrace them. At the same time, we make our stand that what is wrong is wrong. It's not just in the gay scene. Today, every person is holding a device in their hands. Okay? So last time, pornography, you have, to, you have to go and buy the DVD, you have to go and search the magazine. <laughs> no need already now. No need. It's in the hand. It comes into your bedroom. So there's an increase, especially during COVID. People are bought. Okay, so one, uh, one center, uh, one addiction control center says there's a double fall of sexual addiction in our day and age. All right, so uh, we can see many, many fronts. These are just a few examples of what it means to live in the last days okay, where we are bombarded uh, with pagan values. So how do we love God in this kind of environment? You know, maybe some of us say, oh, just read the Bible, pray and go to church. You'll be fine, correct or not? You'll be safe. Is it true? 
you just do this, you'll be okay. Not true, ah. Uh. Because you know only one third of Christians read their Bible every day. Okay, one third only. You know how many, how many percent of Christians go to church every week or not? Especially nowadays. One third only. Okay, so we are losing ground. It's not enough to just do these things to love God well. It's very, very difficult in these last days. So how do we love God well and not just be a Sunday Christian or an online Christian? Okay, online Christian, we welcome you. Uh. Online uh, Maranatha, we welcome you. Not scolding you, uh, don't worry. Uh. So how do we do that? Very difficult, all right? Because uh, loving God and our spiritual life shouldn't be compartmentalized. Okay, we cannot love God just on Sunday uh, and, and leave out the rest. What does the Word of God say about the rest of our lives? Uh, we are commanded to love the Lord with everything within us. Okay, that's the highest and greatest command where it says in Luke 10, 27, love the Lord your God with all your heart, okay, your emotional life, with all your soul, okay, with all your strength, with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, we are told to do that. Every part of our lives, we have to love Him. It's not meant to be compartmentalized. And our spiritual life, God needs to be at the center Okay, not one part of the child. It needs to be in the center. There must be structures to help put God in the center because if you don't have any structure to put God in the center, He will be off-center. Will, you will become a, just a Sunday Christian. Okay, everything that, we, that happens in our spiritual life affects every part of our life. For example, if you are not walking with God right, okay, if you are into sin, addiction, very soon your physical life will be affected. Very soon your social life will be affected. Very soon, your emotional life will be affected as well. And all the other aspects of our life affect our spiritual life as well. Do you know? If you don't exercise well, if you don't eat well, if you don't sleep well, I guarantee your spiritual life will also go down. Okay, so every part of our lives affect one another. And at the center of it needs to be God. At the center of it needs to be our spiritual life. So everything we do or not do have spiritual consequences. It's not just whether you come to church. Everything you do and not do has spiritual consequences, which means everything is actually spiritual. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Everything. Okay, last time, uh, a few years back, there was this trend uh, of wearing a band called what? WWJD. Huh? You all know what it means? WWJD? I think the young people don't know. Not born yet when the trend came. <laughs> what would Jesus do? Okay, because they wear it to remind themselves every day. Why, well, in this situation, what would Jesus do? Okay, what would Jesus do? If we can do that, and if we can give thanks in, for everything in our lives, we are Christ's ambassadors. We are doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians 3, 17, it says, Whatever you do, do it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. Whatever you do, including the household chores, if you do it for yourself, when there's no benefit, you won't do it already. Okay? If you do it for yourself, uh, if if it doesn't benefit you, if, the, if, if you love somebody with no benefits, you won't do it already. If you're doing it for others, when your boss is not watching, will you do or not? Won't do it already. Okay, but when you do it for the Lord, how will you do the work? You will do it excellently, ethically, giving your 100% even when nobody is watching. Okay, so that's the difference. So when you go to work, on Monday, who are you working for? Oh, I hear paycheck. No, no, no. You are working for the Lord. Okay, you represent the Lord. You, your true boss is actually Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it says, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Okay, even though this is in the context of uh, food offered to idols, the spiritual principle is this. 
everything we do, whether you're eating or drinking, even a small thing like eating and drinking, do it for the glory of God. Okay, what does it mean, do it for the glory of God? Uh, the Westminster Confession says the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So glorify glory is a very, very, very chim word, right? What is glorify Him, you know? Such a difficult word. But it's a very important word. Because the glory of God means His greatness, His beauty, His character, His love, His deeds. So to glorify means, glorify Him means, in a simple way, are you making God look great? Are you making God look great? Are you making Him look good or look bad? Okay? Uh, if you're making Him look bad, you are not glorifying Him. You're making Him look good, you are glorifying Him. Okay? Because you are representing Christ. You carry the image of God and wherever you're walking, you're actually an ambassador of Christ. You are little Jesus Christ, okay? So are we glorifying God in whatever we do? Then you may ask, wow, very difficult to glorify God. Lah. Our whole life glorify God. How do you do that? It's very, very difficult. Okay, seemingly impossible, especially in today's world. How do we glorify God? Very, very difficult. So today we want to learn from Daniel and his three friends how to love God well. Okay, uh, they were living in a pagan nation. Okay, they were exiled to this place called Babylon. Okay, and um, they were on their own. But they are able to glorify God with their whole life. Okay, so we, in a sense, we are also living in the modern Babylon, uh, spiritual Babylon. That's why the title is Loving God in Babylon. So the big idea for us this morning is this. How do we love God well? Amidst secular pressures, Okay, by glorifying God with our whole life. How do we do that? So we want to gain uh, inspiration from the life of Daniel and his, and his three friends. So the context is, the Jews were exiled to Babylon in around 500 BC because they were worshipping idols, they were rebelling against God, and they were exiled there for 70 years. Ancient Babylon is what we know today as Iraq, okay, modern-day Iraq. And Babylon invaded Judah, destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, and carried off many, many Jews to Babylon as exiles. Okay, so in that time, it was a powerful city-state. It is the capital city. It was a great, one of the greatest empire in history. And Babylon, this word Babylon is actually mentioned from Genesis to Revelation as a symbol of the Antichrist's evil world system. So if you read the book of uh, Revelation, Babylon the Great, Babylon the city is mentioned six times to represent the worldly system, the antichrist system that we are living in. So the Babylonians actually took the youngest, not told the youngest, they took the young and educated Jews from the royal and noble family. Okay, they took them, all the peasants they leave behind, they, they took the brightest to be trained in the Babylonian university for three years. Okay, they recruited them. And through the university, basically, they brainwashed them. Okay, so that uh, the future Israelite leadership will be brainwashed and uh, they will have capable manpower for the Babylonian empire. So they actually changed Daniel's name to Belshazzar. Okay, Belshazzar basically means, it's a Babylonian name which means, may the wife of God Baal protect the king. They did the same for the, uh, Daniel's three friends. They changed the names to pagan names. Uh, they sent them to the university so that they can learn about the pagan culture and spirituality. The aim is to eliminate any form of distinctiveness as a God follower in Daniel and to absorb, absorb him into the pagan culture. So how is Daniel able to love God in the midst of this hostile and secular environment. How did he do that? Well, with his three friends. So he want to learn from his life how he loved God well in the midst of this kind of environment. First thing we learn from Daniel, he glorified God in his lifestyle. What did Daniel do? So Daniel, 
resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of eunuch to allow him not to defile himself. He says, test your servant for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. At the end of ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate at the king's food. I'm not promoting veganism. Ah. <laughs> not very popular, okay? Everywhere. Okay, so as you look at this, Daniel himself chose not to eat the king's food. Why? Okay, one possibility is that the king's food itself uh, is an indulgent food. Okay, it's a rich food and uh, probably not very healthy. And it has wine, all that, that, that leads to, can, can lead to uh, addiction. Second possible reason for religious reason. Because it, the word defiled. So the food could have been um, offered to idols. The food could contain unclean food like pork. Okay, so he chose not to partake in the food. So it's not also just religious reason because actually he got more healthy. Okay, he looked better. His countenance was better after 10 days uh, by choosing more healthy food, vegetables, water. And uh, it says here that uh, the word here is better in appearance, which is countenance. His countenance was better. Fatter in flesh, not, not, not saying that fat, uh, not obese. Uh. He put on weight. Okay, he was better built. Okay, not asking you to be fatter. He got excuse to be fatter. Okay, no. okay? It's not saying that. Uh. Became better built. Okay, and then uh, the eunuch said, wow, actually it's good. Okay, you can continue your vegetarian diet. diet. We see here that uh, Daniel himself glorified God in his lifestyle. Okay? He chose to be set apart, different, okay? by choosing a different set of diet, choosing a healthier diet. Okay? And um, uh, he, he, he chose uh, not to be uh, controlled by the indulgent food that everyone was eating. So it's the same for us. Okay? How do we glorify God in our lifestyle? Okay, it's not just coming to church, reading your Bible. Uh, it has to do with your entire lifestyle. How do you eat? Are you eating healthily? Okay? How do you exercise? Are you exercising regularly? How are you sleeping? Are you sleeping enough? Okay? Because people look at you, wow. If your countenance is like, wow, every day very tired one, or every day very sick. You know, is it good testimony? No. Okay, so when we, we take care of ourselves, we take care of this a uh, temple of the Holy Spirit okay, that God has given us. Uh, this is the body that God has given us. Huh? He says, do you know, not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? So God has given you a temple. Okay, you're supposed to take care of it so that we can serve God better. Okay, so that uh, we can glorify God in our body. Okay, so if we take things that abuse our body, do you know the Bible doesn't contain a verse that says you cannot smoke? But why is smoking wrong? The Bible also doesn't contain a verse that says you cannot take drugs. Ah. Don't have. Ah. Cannot find one. Why? Why do we not do it? Because smoking, drugs, unhealthy food damages the temple of God. Which is this thing that God has given to us. And the Holy Spirit, God is inside. Okay, He's carrying with us everywhere you go. Whatever we do, remember, the Spirit of God is watching. Okay, whatever sin you want to engage in, just remember, God is inside you. Okay? Uh, so for me, uh, when, I, when, when COVID happened, the circuit breaker, when you're at home, you start eating a lot, right? So I ate a lot also, you know. Nothing to do. Uh, eat, eat, eat. Then I put on weight, you know. Wow, bulging stomach, all that. So I went to, when I went back to church, uh, people say, hey, wow, pastor, why are you... You put on weight, ah? Wow. Then I went for my medical checkup. Okay, before I uh, just before I joined Miranda, I went for my full body body checkup. Then my weight was seventy one. Okay. Then my report came out. You know what my report say? Slightly obese. Wow. I was like, nobody in my entire life I ever call me obese before, you know. So doctor looked at me. Wow. You slightly obese, eh? So I was very offended. Very, very offended. From young people, always say I skinny one. Where got, where got obese? So I decided, no, I cannot. I must do something. 
So I must do something. Okay, so about uh, three months before I joined Maranatha, I decided to go on this thing called the intermittent fast. Intermittent fast means you only, uh, you don't eat for 16 hours. Okay? So basically, you eat at 12, eat your lunch, dinner, you can eat until 8 o'clock. But after 8 o'clock, all the way to 12 noon, don't eat anything. You can only eat in the 8-hour window. Okay, it's called intermittent fast. Then in the morning, you are allowed to drink coffee, lah, okay, coffee without sugar. So basically, the science behind it, uh, if you're, I'm not recommending it to you, uh, it's just my own experience, is that after 12 hours, the body begins to break down fats. Okay, so actually, I don't really believe, lah, I just try. Lah. So I, I, I went on intermittent fast, and in three months, I lost 5 kg. Eh. Wow. 5 kg. Okay, and, and after two months, you no longer feel hungry. Morning is just normal. And you get more energy also. Okay, so those who, uh, after this sermon, get better or slimmer, please give me some commission, okay, uh, for recommending intermittent fast. Okay, so uh, I felt better. I can exercise. I feel more energetic. Don't feel so lethargic. Okay, so for us, we need to take care of our body. I don't know what works for you. Huh? Don't, don't, don't call me on this. Huh? I say, wow, Pastor Alvin bluffed me. Huh? I go and then I stomach it. Yeah, I got, got gastric, gastric cramp. Huh? You know, Pastor Alvin. Okay, no, 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 no. This is just for myself. Huh? Okay, so for us, we need to find out what works for us to have a better, better lifestyle. Okay? And Daniel, Daniel himself, as we see from his example, he adopted a simple lifestyle. He refused to be attracted by all the rich royal food. What does it tell us? It tells us that as believers, we also need to adopt a simple lifestyle. So a lot of times in Christianity, the ambitions of a Christian and the ambitions of a non-Christian, right? If you put them side by side, right? You don't tell that one is a Christian, right? If you look at their ambition, right? It's a very similar one. Non-Christian, Christian, they all go for the 5C. What is the 5C? Can you remember or not? Singapore dream. Cash, career, credit card, car, country club. Not country club last day. Huh? 5C. Same one, same. No difference. Office also talk about the same thing. Except uh, Christian uh, got another C called the 6C. We have what? Christ. We got upper hand because we use Christ to help us fulfill the 5C. Upper hand, upper hand, okay? They don't know one. We have 5C. Then worse, we use the 7C. We got 7C. We tell God, if God, I go to church. So Christ must bless me the 5C. If you never bless me the 5C, it means, uh, hey, Christ, what are you doing? How come you're not helping me the 5C? I'm angry at it. Okay? So that's what happened. So our values our, uh, is, very, is very similar. Okay, so we have to ask, are we set apart? Are we different or not? Uh, from our non-Christian, other than going to church? So you have to ask that because people are also watching. So a lot of times, some Christians will say, I, I already give God my 10%. Okay? How I spend the 90%, please, don't tell me what to do. I'm free to spend. They forget that actually every part of your money belongs to God. 90%, let me do whatever I, I want. So what do they do? Some of them will follow the same values. I will choose goods that are, have a status value. Okay? Goods that actually, not so much functionality, but goods that actually make me look better. Okay, in the eyes of society, in the eyes of uh, different ones. So we have to be careful uh, how we do our lives. So how do we buy? How do we uh, expense? Because the Word of God says where your treasure is there your heart will be also. Which means, how much money you spend on certain things will expose actually where your values and your heart belongs. Okay? So this is subjective. You, you, uh, you have to pray to God. You have to ask God, is there any area of my life okay, that I have put things of the world above you? Okay? So Daniel, second thing. What did Daniel do? Daniel actually glorified God in his work. Okay, when I say work, it, it can mean studies, it can mean paid or unpaid work, it can mean ministry. Yeah? So Daniel himself glorified God in his studies. Okay? So all the students here, all the youth here, you can uh, you know, pay more attention now. Huh? 
Uh, in Daniel 1, 17, it says, As for these four youths, okay, Daniel and his three friends, God gave them learning, skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and chanters that were in all his kingdom. So they were sent to school for three years. Okay? Uh, so this these four youths, basically God blessed them with wisdom, understanding. Okay? And they began to be better, ten times better than the magician and other people uh, from, from the cohort. All right? So what are we saying? Okay? What we're saying is that uh, there's a promise in James 1.5. It says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. Okay, so you can claim this promise. Ask God for wisdom. Okay, to do well in your studies. Uh, and because God gave them the wisdom, does it mean the four friends were lazy? No, huh? they worked hard. They did well in their studies to glorify God. In the same way, uh, for you, your work is actually your studies. Okay, so are you studying for your parents to make them happy? No, uh. are you studying for yourself so that in future you can earn more money? No. The person that you are studying for is actually God. Why? When you do your best in what God has given to you, you are glorifying God. You are making God look good. You are making Him look great in your life. So as you study uh, and give your best, it glorifies God. But Singaporean uh, students and Singaporean parents have a different problem. Huh? The problem is not studying hard. Because what? Every family, every Christian family study hard, right? The kids. The problem is we study too hard. Right? So our problem is different. Our problem in the, in, even in the church is different. During exam, what happened? The kids go missing. Why? Because near exam. Never mind, never mind. Study, study. <laughs> Stay at home and study. So our, our problem is different. Okay? Uh, studies have become an idol. Studies have become something that we place our identity uh, in. All right? So at the end of the day, glorifying God in our studies means putting God first. Yet at the same time, we are studying for God. Not ourselves, not for our parents, not for our teachers. Okay? Uh, so how you are as a student uh, will actually draw people nearer to God or people further away from God. Next thing, we see Daniel glorify God in his actual work. Okay, Daniel himself, uh, we see here, he says the king was angry and very furious. He commanded that all the wise men in Babylon be destroyed. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. So the king actually wanted to kill all the magicians and wise men because none of them can tell him what is his dream. He had a dream. Okay? None of them can tell him. And he wanted to kill all of them, but Daniel said, No. I must go and speak to the king and tell him, hey, wait, let me go and pray and I will give you the, uh, what, you had, what dream you had. Okay, so he went in at, at the expense of his life. Uh, he did what was right. Okay, and God answered his prayer and he's able to reveal the dream uh, to Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so we see that Daniel actually did his work. Okay, this is his work with excellence. He did his work with integrity. Okay, he prayed and involved God in his work. So work actually uh, constitutes a majority of our waking hours. Okay, we spend so much time at work. So the question is, are we glorifying God in our work? How do people at work see you? Okay, are you the one that always skive? Are you the one that always take the, the stationery? Are you the one that always go for a very long lunch break? Okay, or are you the one that stand up for what is right? Are you the one uh, that produce excellent work? Because when we do that, we are able to point people to Christ. 
uh, I, I'm glad to hear some, uh, as I talk to different ones, some of you have been brought into the church, okay, because uh, some of you were colleagues, some of you were actually students, okay, and you brought somebody in, which means you were glorifying God in your work because when you did that, uh, people are able to come to Christ through you. Um, even for myself, uh, before I took over, uh, there was something very big happening, okay, which is what? Uh, I was anticipating because Julian was going to retire. Okay? Pastor Tim was going to retire. Pastor Media was going on maternity leave. Huh? All in July, and I'm the only one. Huh? So I was quite worried, you know? Like, wow. Crazy already. Uh. I, I'm the only one in church. Uh. How to handle all this workload? Then I was say, uh, I asked, okay, uh, can we uh, uh, recruit uh, admin staff, new admin staff? Then they were telling me, wow, very hard to recruit admin staff in the church one. Very hard. You try many years already. Not possible. I was very worried. I was like, wow. Now I must do everybody's job, that means. So I prayed, God, you know, give me a good admin staff so that Pastor Amelia can go on leave and I don't have to slog like a... <laughs> so we prayed, okay, and within one month, okay, uh, we, we just did an online portal. 100 people, 100 people sign up, eh? <laughs> I was like, whoa, so many. So now my problem is what short list, uh. Cut, 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 cut. Wow. And then within one month, you know, we interviewed a few people and then, wow, God answered my prayer. Oh, three months before Pastor Media go on, on maternity, our dear Cheryl came to the church. Wow, let's give God praise. Oh, she's a prayer answered. Okay, and she's a good worker. God handpicked her to come and serve us in this time. So God works as we bring Him into our workplace, as we pray to Him, God does miracles. And today I'm relaxed. Ah. I'm not burning out ah, because God's Cheryl. Ah. Huh? Pastor Amelia don't need work because God's Cheryl. Huh? Praise God, praise God, okay? Praise God. So we need to involve God in our work and uh, he, he will come true for us. Next, we see, uh, see Daniel actually glorifying God in his relationship. So when Daniel was trying to figure out what was the king's dream, actually he sought the help of his friends. Okay, in verse 17 it says, Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and he told them to seek mercy from the Lord of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So when Daniel was facing a difficult situation, he didn't go it, go it alone. He had a spiritual community that praying with him, supporting him through this difficult time. Okay, I give thanks for the GEMS ministry, okay, uh, who has always been supporting the ladies with prayer requests. So that's important. I give thanks that most of you are in, uh, in, in, in small groups, cell groups, uh, supporting one another uh, as a spiritual community. So if you have, do not have a spiritual community, do not belong to a, a cell group, I want to challenge you to find one because in difficult time, you call for help, uh, nobody. Uh. Because why? In good times, you never build that spiritual community that will help you through tough times. So for me as well, uh, when I know that I'm going to lead as SP, I, I was quite scared. Because I said, wow, one person, uh, how to lead in the long run? 36 years, uh, well, how to lead? Cannot, uh. I don't have 36 years. Uh, maybe I got 10 years, 15 years. How to lead in the long run? Not possible, you know. So before I came in, uh, tr nine, months, nine months ago, I actually formed an uh, accountability group okay, uh, with, uh, with two other senior pastors, uh, AOG pastors, who are around the same age. Okay, of course, one is more handsome than me. Uh, okay, I, don't, I don't mind, okay? even though he's more handsome. So we came together every month, you know, uh, supporting one another, praying one another, growing in the Lord together. So you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with a team. Go with one another. 
So we need that. Okay, so we, we need the spiritual community to edify one another. They have been uh, wonderful support. You know, a lot of things I don't know, I will ask them. So it's always been refreshing uh, to just meet them once a month and, and to talk about things that we cannot talk to anybody. I cannot talk to you also. Okay, you'll be stumbled. Uh. You also cannot help me, uh, you know. Huh? So, so it's important. Okay, you need to find your own mentoring group. You need to find your own spiritual community, your huddle, so that you can share your life in this journey of loving God. Huh? Next, we see how Daniel and his friends glorified God in their suffering. In their suffering. All right, so uh, this passage is actually talking about uh, the three friends of Daniel. Daniel is not here. I don't know why. Maybe he went for a business trip. Uh, the three friends of Daniel, and as they were facing the fiery furnace, okay, they were facing a fiery furnace because the three friends refused to worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. Uh, and uh, they were being pushed to the fiery furnace. And before they went in, the three friends, this was what the three friends says, uh, he says, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So glorifying God in our whole lives also include glorifying God in our low times, in our suffering. And the, uh, Daniel's three friend was able to do that with an amazing attitude. Okay, they say, God is able to deliver us. But even if He do not, we will serve Him only. If we can do that in our life, if we can do that in our suffering, let me tell you, it will be powerful. Okay, it will be powerful. We, we, can, we can be like them who pray, God can heal me. But even if He does not, I will smile. Even if He cannot, I will still have faith in Him. Uh, in James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you will be complete, perfect, lacking in nothing. Who count all joy when we go through trouble? Nobody. Uh. Nobody. Okay, but when we can do that, we can have the right attitude uh, of faith, love, and hope. Let me tell you, as you go through suffering, you can impact life. You can touch other people because your attitude is different uh, from others. Okay, I have a, I have a friend. Uh, I have a friend. Uh, his name is Aaron. Okay, uh, he suffers from uh, muscle atrophy over the years. Okay, so he, he needs a wheelchair. Uh, and... In these past two years, because he stays in a nursing home, even though he has a job in Apple, uh, he can't travel out of the nursing home most of the time. And he's been in this nursing home for two years, and I can only vis visit him. I cannot go, even go in. I have to visit him at the gate. Uh. Okay, I, uh, they don't allow guests. Okay, I pass him groceries uh, uh, during my off days. Uh, and, and even though he's suffering so much, uh, he even broke the leg uh, recently. Even though he's suffering so much, I'm very blessed by him. He gave me more blessing uh, than I bless him. Uh, because why? In the midst of his suffering, he's always joyful. Always joyful. Uh, his cast, he wrote this word, faith, hope, and love. Wow. Powerful. If I look at him, uh, I got any problems, right? My problem is nothing. Uh. Okay, he's a young man, but he chose to have faith, hope, and love in God. And he blessed many people in his life okay, because of his positive attitude. So we can do that uh, as well. It's not easy. It's not easy to count all joy, but as we do that, we glorify God in our suffering. Last point. Daniel glorified God in his spiritual disciplines. Daniel glorified God in his spiritual disciplines. Uh, it says here, we shall not find any ground. Okay, the, the wise men are trying to scheme against Daniel, against this Daniel, unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes a petition, okay, whoever makes a petition, to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, 
shall be cast into the den of lions. When Daniel knew that the document has been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then this man came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. So the, 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 the wise men, uh, the magicians, they try to find fault with Daniel, but they couldn't find any. So they made a, a, a the king sign a document that says anyone who prays uh, to anyone except the king will be thrown into the den of lions. And we see what, what did Daniel do. Daniel knelt on his knees three times to pray as usual. So what does it tell us? It means that it is something that he does regularly. Something that he needed to keep his spiritual life vibrant in the land of Babylon. He had a structure, he has a system, he has a routine where he can seek God, where he can, he can uh, uh, tutor his inner life because he needs it to stay connected with God and not uh, be swung towards uh, being a pagan in this environment. So that was what grounded him. That was what uh, made him the man that he was. So it is the same for us. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, it tells us, train yourself to be godly. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way at its whole promise to the present life and the life to come. The word train here is the word gymnazo. Okay, gymnazo in Greek. Uh, which means to discipline yourself like an athlete. Okay? Uh, and and, and to, to watch what you eat, to watch your training. So uh, discipline is a bad word in this day and age. People don't like this word. People like free and easy, do whatever you want. But for godliness to happen, the scripture tells us we need to train ourselves. We need to set up structure, we need to set up routine so that we move ourselves towards godliness. And it has value in the present life and the life to come. It is something that you need to do daily to cultivate your relationship uh, with God. So for myself, uh, something that I do daily that has uh, benefited me over the last decade is that every day I just have a simple routine before I read the newspaper, before I do anything, I spend time uh, using this, this, uh, this tool called the Life Application Study Bible. One chapter a day for the last decade. One chapter a day, Life Application Study Bible and just glean from one chapter what the Lord wants to say to me. So everybody, we are all different. We must find a way so that we can glean, cultivate our relationship with God. It's very different for my wife, very different for other people, but you need to find a way to structure so that you spend time alone with God. When you spend time hearing from God, and that is how you move your life uh, and, and your spiritual disciplines of prayer, Bible study, and church and cell group towards godliness. So godliness is not cultivated over time. Okay? Eh, hey, what happened? How come my, my slide missing few words? <laughs> Okay, the few words that are missing there uh, got eaten up, uh, spiritual warfare. Okay, the few words that are missing there is every person starts with belief. Okay, your belief will dictate your actions. Okay, your actions would dictate your habits. Okay, the last two are there. Uh, and habits over time will form your character. It's not formed overnight, uh. Habits form your character and character will form your destiny. Okay, belief, actions, habits, character, destiny. So sometimes people ask, hey, I want to be like the godly person over there. I want to. How would the person become like that? Ah? It's not overnight. It is because the person has chosen to take deliberate steps daily to form a habit so that it forms their character and at the end of the day, it determines their destiny. So for us, how do we love God with all of ourselves? 
how do we love God in our lifestyle? How do we love God uh, in our work, our relationships, our suffering, and our spiritual disciplines? How do we love God with 100% of all that is in us? I want to tell you, it is impossible. Because after this sermon, you will feel very dejected. Okay, like, Ayah, Pastor, forget it. Lah. So hard. Even I cannot do it. Let's give up. Lah. Let's all go home. How to love God with everything within us? It is impossible. Uh, because the great commandment is still a law, and law brings death. We cannot fulfill the law of the great command. We can't. Because there is a new law. And the new law is the covenant of love. In the covenant of love, we are able to love God. Because why? He first loved us. It's only when we experience the love of God are we able to love God well. It's only when uh, we experience the cross of Jesus Christ are we able to love God well. The harder we try, the harder we fail. But the moment when we look to Jesus, how He lived His life, loving God with His whole life, He is our model. When we look to the cross, we say we cannot make it, we can't make up the big gap. Jesus made up the gap with the cross. When we say we can't do it, God sent His Holy Spirit into our hearts to empower us. That's how we love God well. That's how we can do it because of the covenant of love in our hearts. Even as we end this series, I want to bring us back to the first picture that I shared with you. Okay, as the musician come forward. Uh, the first picture in my first sermon is this Japanese pottery called Kinzugi. Kinzugi. Okay, Kinzugi, uh, I shared in my first sermon. Many a times, our lives are like this pottery. There are many cracks, many things that are broken in our lives. But in this Japanese art, this art is basically trying to uh, mend this bowl together with gold. Okay? And because it's mended with gold, the actually final product is much more expensive and precious than the initial product. And that is our life. That is the goal of emotionally healthy spirituality. God wants to mend the brokenness in our lives. Not through go, but through the blood of Christ. As He mends the broken pieces, actually the final product is more powerful, more wonderful. Because now that it's broken, okay, we are able to lean on God. Now that it's broken, we are able to show other people, hey, I'm broken too. But God wants to use me to love you. God wants to use me to love God well because it is His blood that mended us. It is His love that helped us to love Him well and to love others well. As we close, let us arise on our feet and begin to just surrender our broken lives before God and say, Lord, we are that Kinzuki. So many areas of our life are broken. So many areas of our life are sinful. So many areas of our life we have not loved you well, Lord. But this morning, we present the broken pieces of our lives to God and say, Lord, we invite the blood of Christ. to mend, to fill up the gaps that we are not able, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Fill the gaps that we are inadequate. Fill the gaps that are pain in our lives, O Lord. With the blood of Christ, O Lord. And because you have done that for us, O oh Lord, 
We surrender our lives to you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Our lives belong to you. We want to be that living sacrifice on the altar for your use, O oh Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. So touch my brothers and sisters here. Their past, their hurts, O oh Lord. We plead the blood of Christ to come over them right now, Lord. Even as they surrender these areas to you, may you anoint them afresh and anew. The love of Christ. Hallelujah, Lord. That we'll be able to love you well. We love others well, Lord. Because you have loved us well. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So let us surrender ourselves. Let us present ourselves as that that living sacrifice. Even as we close with this song, we say, Lord, come and anoint us. Holy Spirit, rekindle our hearts, O Lord, with your love once again, O Lord. Help us to glorify you in all that we do, O Lord. So we praise you. We surrender our lives to you, O Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Hallelujah. Let's sing this.